All right. So in our next part here, we're going to start cutting the chassis and uh, mounting some of the components. And I just thought before I get started with this, I'd go over a few of the basics. You know, not everybody has the tools um, to punch out a chassis or whatever. And there's they can be very expensive, but there's also some economical ways to do it. So let's let's go over a couple of those and then I'll show you everything here and how it works. So the first thing that you have to worry about is like this, which is a eight pin um, octal tube socket. Okay. And there are different sizes of tubes. So like for your rectifier tubes and for your um, like this would be for a rectifier tube or for the bigger output tubes okay and you can see they have a couple different kinds um, there's this one that just uses a little snap ring that goes in behind it like this and just kind of snaps behind it and you got this kind that's a flange mount and you can mount it from beneath or you can mount it from the top and put a couple screws in there uh, you also have the smaller ones, which like your 9 pins and your, even your 7 pins. And those mount um, on the chassis. But in order to mount these, you have to drill a relatively large hole. I mean, when you look at this thing, you know, you're looking at, you know, upwards of an inch in diameter or bigger. So you look at this, we got an inch. So that's drilling a 1 inch hole, that's pretty big. And of course, you know, you're not going to get much bigger drill bits than this, typically, um, going to Sears or wherever, you know, just local hardware store. So how do we do that? Okay. So there are some different ways to do it. Um, you know, in the past, when I started out as a kid, I just didn't have any way to drill the holes. So, you know, I would cut, I'd take a bit, I would draw my circle, and I would cut several holes around there, and then I would kind of nip them nip them out with a set of clippers or something, you know, a set of wire cutters um, or some tin snips. And then I would finish off with a round file, you know, or a half round file and clean it out. And it wasn't perfect, but it, I was able to mount the tube socket in there. Okay. Um, another way, if you can afford them, is to use what's called a chassis punch or a knockout punch. Now, what you're going to find is, this is basically, you just basically have your punch and your little die that it punches into. And you would drill a pilot hole, you know, like this with your drill bit. Stick this through the hole like this. Put this on the other side like this. Okay, and you would thread it. Like that. And then you just use a wrench and tighten it down. And it'll draw this up through and it'll slowly punch a perfect hole okay a um, couple of things that I don't like about knockout punches is number one if it's heavier metal you really got a crank on these now they even make ones like this that have a little thrust bearing on them and it makes it easier to turn this when you're punching it but even with that, that it's it can be pretty tight. Okay, um, that's one problem. The second problem is these are very expensive, and they're usually designed to be the size of conduit, like for electrical conduit. They're not really made to the size of um, you know tube sockets and things like that. Now, in the old days. They made companies like this made what's called a radio chassis punch set, and it's the same basics thing. Okay, this one I picked it up at an old electronics store that was going out of business. I've only used it once or twice, but it's a similar thing. But the sizes of the punches correspond to the sizes of electronic components, such as tube sockets and uh, the aluminum can capacitors and things like that. If you get your hands on these or on a set of them, um, some of them, the real old ones came in a nice wooden box. 
um, great. They show up on eBay once in a while, but usually people know what they got. They're going to charge you an arm and a leg. Now recently, they've come up with what we call the Christmas tree bit. And I wonder why they call it that. <laughs> anyway, the Christmas tree bit, or the step bit as they call it, um, is a really neat thing because you can. it starts out as a drill bit. If you notice, it has a point. And you just start drilling through and it just steps down and cuts the hole bigger, 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 bigger until you get it to the size that you need. Um, and it actually cuts a very clean hole and it cuts very quickly and it's a lot faster than drilling a pilot hole and then using these expensive chassis punches. These punches can be upwards of $75 a piece. So to get a whole good set of them brand new, big bucks. Um, but these Christmas tree bits, if you buy the Greenlee, which that's this one's an original Greenlee, these can be upwards of $100 for the bigger ones. But uh, if you all have a Harbor Freight near you, uh, which is a low-end tool store, I kind of call it, um, or you can go to harborfreight.com, go online, they sell a set, and believe it or not, they work really, really well. Remember, you're cutting aluminum. Typically, you're not cutting a steel chassis, even though some chassis are steel. You're usually going to either make or purchase an aluminum chassis. These work fantastic. They last for years, and they come in multiple sizes. And I think a set of these these two came, and I think they came to maybe 20 bucks, something like that. And uh, that's all you need. And you can chuck them up in your drill press, or you can use a hand drill. You got to be careful with the hand drill when you get to the bigger diameters. If it catches, you can really twist your wrist and injure yourself. So you got to be careful. But they work really well. The other thing I like that they sell is these little reamers, these taper reamers. And you can, as you can see, they're designed to be put in your cordless drill. And whenever you're cutting, like for a potentiometer, the shaft of a pot, sometimes the standard drill bit sizes just aren't exactly the right size. So you cut a little bit small, and then you just kind of go a little bit at a time with this and clean it out till the pot fits perfectly. You can make a very professional looking job. The other thing this is good for is it will deburr the hole. It will take those little burrs off and make the hole nice and smooth. Give it a little bit of a taper on. If you poke it from each side, it will actually put a little chamfer on either side. It will keep it from being sharp. So very good tools to have. So these are what I use. Um, the other thing you're going to need is some punches. Now. Here's the old school ones, and I have tons of them. You basically, you know, take that, take your hammer, give it a whack. These work pretty good. These are my favorite, though. They're a spring-loaded automatic punch. So, um, you can punch a piece of metal, and it puts a really nice divot right in it. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find a little piece of metal down here. So, if you see, one pop, and if you look right there, perfect little little dimple right there. One shot, and that's just enough for your drill bit to have a starting point, and it also marks the center of your hole, so you know, you know, so you can make sure that all of your tube sockets are aligned properly and everything. Nothing drives me crazier than when a drill bit walks around on me and then my tube sockets end up being off center from one another. You know, you're trying to do a neat job and, you know. Um, of course you need some drill bits and anytime I get a chance to get drill bits and they're decent quality and I can pick them up for a good price, I pick them up. They're cheap and, you know, can never have too many. So, that's another thing. So, Basically, with these basic tools, and you can you don't have to have a really expensive drill. Um, you know, a little Black & Decker. I like this. little Black & Decker lithium $20 drill. They work great. They're lightweight, and they, they get the job done. Um, so again, you can make yourself an amp pretty inexpensively without really spending a lot of money on tools if you're kind of short on cash. But that's how I do it. So 
Next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the chassis laid out. I'm going to use my template to punch some center holes um, for where all the components are going to mount. I'm going to use this and then we're going to go through and drill it. The other thing I stopped and picked up, because mine were wore out, was uh, always great to have a Dremel or to have a rotary tool. Um, these little brushes are really nice, these aluminum brushes, or I mean these uh, brass brushes, um, and they also make these little uh, abrasive discs that I use. Uh, two reasons I'm going to use these. Number one, it's nice for deburring, again, when you drill your holes, and use it to deburr. But the other thing is, if, if you remember, this chassis is not normal. Um, it's hard to see in the light, but see how it kind of sparkles? The reason it sparkles is it has a powder coating on it, and it's kind of a slippery kind of powder coating. It's not normal paint, and not very good for using for ground. So whenever you drill like your mounting holes for your uh, terminal strips and things like that, where this makes contact, that's ground. And you can use that for ground. You can see this, this one here. This is a ground terminal. Well, it's not going to make a very good ground touching that paint or whatever. And even if it was bare metal, just the oils and things, you don't want tarnish on there. So I use these to, to kind of scuff it up a little bit and clean it up before I put my, uh, my terminal strip down. Then I'll tighten this with stainless steel screws instead of uh, zinc so you won't get any corrosion. Crank them down with some lock washers and this will make a very good ground to use for your ground plane. Okay, So those are a few tips and uh, I'm going to be using those tips myself here now. You're going to see uh, when I start laying out the chassis and drilling it out and mounting the components. So that's what's coming next. Okay, just going to do a little update here. I'm punching out the holes for the tube sockets and for the uh, capacitors right now. And uh, the Christmas tree bit that I have is not exactly the right size for the holes that I need. Um, the one step is too small, the next step is a little bit too big. So I have these chassis punches which are the correct size for the ones I need. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys the process. I, I mean, if you haven't seen it already, um, you basically take the punch and the die part and you thread it in. This one's got a bearing on it, so it's actually very easy to turn. The ones without the bearings, you get quite a bit of friction on the top, and they can get kind of tight, especially with this eighth inch thick aluminum. So, so you take this in your pilot hole, you know, tighten it down, snug with your finger, and then see if I can do this without hitting the camera. And you just rotate this around. Just like that. And it'll just pop loose. And there you go. Simple as that. And then we take, take this out and pull the slug out. This is called the slug. Now, there are other versions of this that are called slug buster. You notice this has two points on it. They make one with a four point and kind of an odd shape to it. And the whole purpose of that is when it bends the slug like this, it snaps it. So it comes out in two pieces so it doesn't get stuck inside the die like that. Um, and it pops right out. But uh, those are very expensive and uh, I have one or two that I picked up over the years, but these work good. And as you can see, very, very smooth hole. It punches. And uh, it's simple as that. So I'm going to go ahead and finish punching these out. I have the smaller die that I'm going to use for my two, my uh, 6BQ5s and, you know, the, and the driver tube sockets. And once we do that, we're going to get everything, get all the little holes drilled, and start uh, mounting the sockets and so forth. So, just want to give you a little update of what we're doing. Alright, 
moving along here. Um, I got some, most of the holes punched out. I got the terminal strips positioned, and as you can see, I cleared uh, <coughs> cleared off the aluminum using just one of these brush things, you know, one of these little abrasive pads with my Dremel. And uh, just to get good ground, I used stainless steel screws and uh, block washers so there won't be any corrosion or anything. And then I made up a little bracket here for what's going to hold the transistor eventually, which is going to be like this. And it's going to kind of be bent over and then heat shrunk with leads on it. And uh, I'm going to use these to heat sink it for the insulator. These are uh, little ceramic isolator pads and the little ceramic eyelets that go with it in there and uh, I'll mount that right there and as you can see I cleaned that off as well this has heat sink compound on it so the whole chassis becomes a heat sink um, <clears throat> obviously this thing's upside down right now but the capacitors will go this way and uh, the only thing I don't like is I chose these, and these are not my favorite uh, sockets. They're ceramic. They're really high quality, but they're really hard to get the pins in straight. And the other thing is the way this thing mounts, if you look, you can see it doesn't come all the way out. See how it's kind of recessed? But I did check and the tubes fit down in there perfectly. I don't have, they don't bottom out or anything. So we should be okay with that. These are the, the EL84s. The other ones for the driver tubes, the preamp tubes, mount from the top. And then you have this, the uh, noise shield. And this actually goes over top mounts down on there and that's what mounts that in so that'll be okay we won't have any problems there and I still need to get some screws in order to uh, mount the tube sockets or I may use pop rivets I'm not sure yet but uh, I have some little tiny M3 screws but I don't have the nuts they're ordered but they're not in yet so still not sure on that made up some grommets for the lead throughs for the transformers and as you can see I should be getting the output transformers tomorrow I don't want to pre-drill those until I know for sure um, that you know what the spacing is so I'll drill those out probably next <clears throat> right now what I'm working on is if you look here the uh, cathode resistors on the output tubes. I went with some nice heavy duty chassis mount 10 watt aluminum resistors and I've punched out the holes for those and I've got to find some sort of screws or something that'll fit those teeny tiny little holes and mount that in there. So I'll have to look around for that. So I'm working on that right now and then uh, once I get that mounted, the actual bypass capacitor, which is going to be like a 470 microfarad. Maybe something to this. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I have some 470s. I think this is a 470. Yep. And it'll just mount right on top of there real neatly. So that's pretty much what we're looking at. That's where we are now. And uh, once I get everything else mounted up onto the chassis, we'll be ready to start wiring this thing. Okay, here's, uh, we're back. And as you can see, the output transformers just came in. And when I say they just came in, I mean it. When I opened up the box, um, I smelled wet paint. And when I pulled these out, the end belts were still even a little bit sticky. So, I mean, they just made these. Um, so we got everything finished up. Sorry if the camera's shaking. I have it off the stand right now so I can show you around. Um, 
I ordered some little uh, Allen head screws here. And you can see they just fit. They're M3s. And they kind of look like rivets, so it makes them kind of look retro. I got the capacitors mounted. I got the power transformer and the choke coil mounted. And uh, let me set this in the stand here for a second. And if we tip this on up, it weighs a ton. And there's the inside. So let me get you zoomed in on that. I'm going to have to hold it because it's kind of topsy-turvy. But as you can see, not much under here yet. But I got the terminal strips. If you noticed, I wired all the grounds together. Okay, so we have a centralized grounding. And I did that even though I cleaned these off. In case one of these screws should ever come loose, we're not going to break our ground integrity. And this wire is actually a Teflon coated wire with um, silver plating on the copper conductor. So it's very conductive. This wire is good for 600 volts of insulation, up to 600 volts, and it will not melt. I mean, when you hit it with the soldering iron, it will not melt. So it's a very good wire to use in tube gear, especially around where it's going to get hot. All right. So we got it all grounded. We have our. Uh, cathode bias resistors installed. I put a little bit of heat sink grease under each of them. I have the, a little heat sink that's uh, attached to the chassis and that, again that's for the voltage regulator transistor. And uh, this is it. So I'm going to mount the uh, speaker terminals and the input jacks here and get the pot mounted in here as well as the loudness switch and then we're going to start wiring up so we're going to call this uh, the end of this part and uh, in the next part of the series we're actually going to start wiring the amp up so uh, thanks for being along and we'll see you next next part